ויידבר אדוני אל משה לאמור. דבר אל בני ישראל לאמור בחודש השביעי באחד לחודש יהיה לכם שבתון זיכרון תרוע מקרא קודש. קל מלקט עבודה לו תעשו והיק רבתם יישא לאדוני. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, speak to B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a Shabbat rest, a memorial of blowing shafarot, a holy convocation. You are to do no regular work and you are to present an offering made by fire to the Lord. Thank you. Well, thank you for braving the weather. Wow. I heard there was just big clouds and ominous appearance, but you came out, and we're so glad you did. We have a real treat tonight. Ron Cantor is a close friend. We, with Bonnie and Julia and me, we, we served together in Odessa, Ukraine, and then we moved together to Budapest, Hungary, right, Ron, with your wife and and uh, three daughters. We were, me and you and all these women, we went to Odessa, we went to Ukraine. And uh, Ron is an amazing man with a special grace on him, raised under Dan Juster and Mike Brown and these wonderful um, fathers in the faith. He was on staff at Brownsville School of Ministry as a teacher, not only with us at MJBI, but but he, he's resided in Israel for many years now with his Israeli Sabra wife. And uh, he was the lead pastor and now one of the uh, elders of Teferit Yeshua congregation in Tel Aviv. And uh, he's an evangelist. And we are so honored to have him. We're going to watch a video, a little bit about Ron Cantor, and then Ron's going to come and bring the word to us. I love entering these, uh, these races, you know, because as an immigrant, uh, you're often feeling like you're outside of the culture. You're not part of the people. There, there's a, a feeling of Nicole, alienation. But when you are with 10,000 Israelis running, biking, swimming, there's a sense of oneness. And, and maybe that's not spiritual to some people, but for me, I just love being part of this people. We moved here 15 years ago, but I remember thinking, I, I must be the worst father in the world. I brought my kids to the Middle East. Bombs are exploding here. And I was, I was scared. I remember that first day, I was so tired. We got to the place where we were gonna be staying, and I remember we, we went to bed depressed, all of us. But we woke up the next morning, and you know what? Hit the ground running, never looked back. Learning Hebrew was the greatest challenge in my life, without a doubt. Um, my plan was to come here, take two years off, learn Hebrew, be preaching, teaching, everything in Hebrew. Didn't go that way. It took me seven years before I preached my first message in Hebrew. And I remember thinking, it's not gonna happen. I will never learn this language. My brain was just arguing with me, Ron, we're not doing this. And yet we did. But I remember asking, I said, God, can't you just give me Hebrew supernaturally and download it to my brain? And he actually spoke to me. He said, yes, Ron, I can. But you're learning more than Hebrew. You're dying to yourself. You're being broken. I'm crushing your pride. You see, I can preach in Africa in front of 100,000 people. And then suddenly here I was in front of 45 people, terrified. So yeah, I learned Hebrew and a lot more. I love the congregation. It's, uh, I remember when I first came, didn't speak any Hebrew, and it's a Hebrew-only congregation. So for a while, I didn't understand anything, but I was surrounded by native-born Israelis who had embraced Yeshua. And then in 2013, when I became the lead pastor, I suddenly was living my entire life in Hebrew. Now, even though I was fluent in Hebrew, most of the time I'd speak English, but I suddenly had a staff in, uh, except for one guy, nobody spoke English. 
So every staff meeting, every phone call, every WhatsApp conference, every email, everything was in Hebrew and it was awesome. Tel Aviv is a city, uh, the greater Tel Aviv area has the largest concentration of Jewish people in the world, 3.5 million. And we love being right in the center of it all. Where else would you want to live? So what does the future hold? Kod Yisrael Yivasha, all Israel will be saved. Romans 11, 26, it's a prophecy. It's in the Bible, it's going to happen, it has to happen. And that's why we're here. We've situated ourselves to be in place to see this great revival in the end of the age in Israel and in the nations. Hallelujah. It's good to be here with you this evening. Um, greetings from Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, I prepared a bunch of Texas jokes, but then I heard that there's some people packing here, so I, I'm going to scrap those. <laughs> no, Texas is great. I always say that. Um, I forget it. <laughs> Um, my name is Ron, and uh, we've got some materials in the hallway at the end of the service. I think we do. I believe we do. Um, there's a book I wrote, Identity Theft. Has anybody read Identity Theft? One, two, three. Did you enjoy it? It's a really uh, interesting book because I, didn't, I, I wrote it by accident. Uh, I wrote it as a teaching book, and long story short, uh, the Lord spoke to me right as I sent it into the publisher to rewrite it as a novel. And I get emails regularly from people saying, I bought your book by accident, not realizing it was a novel, but I really enjoyed it. It's a novel about the Jewish roots of the faith. Uh, if you do not like it, I will not return your money, but it, you'll be giving it to a good cause. You're going to like it. And it's, there's a sequel called The Jerusalem Secret that is out there as well. And then my testimony book, I'm Jewish, I came to faith in 1983. It's a really exciting story how God saved me. I'd love for you to get that book and then give it to somebody who does not yet believe. Um, it's called Leave Me Alone, I'm Jewish. And uh, that's what I told my best friend when he got born again and began to share with me. So you can get those in the hallway. And then what lastly, uh, the message I'm sharing tonight, it comes from a book we wrote called uh, The Coming In Time Awakening. And you can get that book free. Uh, all you need to do is just sign up when you leave here tonight. There's some clipboards outside. Put your first name and email, and we will send you that book this week uh, for free. The Coming In Time Awakening. So let's pray, and then we'll share that message with you tonight. Abba, we thank you for this time together. We ask right now for your anointing. I pray that you would awaken our hearts, that we would have a longing to hear that great trumpet, O oh God, that will signify the coming of another age, the coming of Yeshua, the King Messiah, O oh God. Father, put a hunger in our hearts to participate in that end time awakening that will lead up to that last great trumpet. Father God, we choose, Lord God, not to be part of that great falling away, apostasy, Lord God, but we want to be that remnant that follows hard after you, O oh God, in the name of Yeshua. So bless this time this evening. Do the scriptures predict an end time awakening? I was uh, with a group of pastors in Israel and uh, we were having a very intense dis discussion. About 30 pastors there. It was actually a little bit contentious over certain things that I won't go into tonight. But one of them spoke up and he asked the question. He says, does the Bible promise an end time awakening? Now, he was saying it does not. He has come up through a theology that basically teaches that things are just going to get worse and worse and more difficult and more miserable and more horrible and then one day Yeshua Jesus is going to come and just take us away. I don't believe that. 
I believe and can prove to you in Scripture that the Bible teaches that there is going to be a radical end time awakening that will lead to the coming of Jesus. It's hard for me to believe that Jesus is going to come back to, I mean, just imagine, who, who, who's married here? Probably a lot of you. You remember your wedding day? How about you men? Remember your wedding day? Remember, you, who goes in first? The men, are, I forget what culture I'm in. The men, and then he waits, right? And the bride comes in, right? Right. Imagine the bride comes, <clears throat> and she's reading People magazine, and her dress is dirty, and it's, it's, it's ripped in a few places. She's kind of disinterested. Jesus is not coming back for a bride like that. He's going to come back for a bride that is longing, that is waiting, that is hungering for his return. <clears throat> I believe there's going to be an end time awakening. Yes, with persecution. I can read the Bible. There will be a great persecution. There will be an antichrist figure. He will not like us. I don't believe in dominion theology, that we're going to take over the world and then present it to Yeshua, but neither do I believe in broken theology, where we are just broken and miserable, and then he returns. And I long for that revival. I long for a move of God. Now, when I use the word revival, I don't mean a sign that you put up on a church and say, we're having three days of revival. A re real God-breathed revival is not something that you can plan you can pray for it, you can fast, you can long for it, but when God suddenly shows up and breathes on a city, everything changes. Amen. I had the great privilege to be part of the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida in the mid-90s. I was a teacher there towards the end of the revival, and it was just awesome. The things that would happen, we would do baptisms. I remember one time a, a little girl comes in the baptismal pool, the immersion tank, and she says, uh, she talks about being in a broken family and her, her, her mother and her father, they don't talk, they fight, but somehow in the midst of that, she got born again. And she was going in the waters of immersion to confess publicly that Yeshua, Jesus, is her Messiah. And then she comes out of the water, and then a woman walks in, uh, you know, maybe in her, her, her mid-30s, and she says, you know what, me and my husband, we didn't get along, we fought all the time, and, and that was my daughter. And she came home, and she told me what God did in her life, and I got born again. And then she gets immersed, and she comes back, everybody's crying, she goes up, and then a man comes. And he said, I used to yell at my wife, I, I was a horrible father, husband, but that's my wife and my child, and I got born again. That's what happens when God breathes on a city. Whole families are brought back together. Hallelujah. Addictions are broken. Bars shut down. Crime de decreases. That's what we're looking for. A move of God. And I've longed for that ever since I've been a believer. Reading books. Just devouring books on revival. And now that we live in Israel, we're longing for the day that we can see Kol Yisrael Yivasha, all Israel shall be saved, or Zechariah 12.10 where it talks about the Jewish people in Jerusalem looking upon the one whom they have pierced in mourning. Or Zechariah 13.1, a fountain of forgiveness will be opened up in Jerusalem. One day Jewish people will find their Messiah and they will be rejoicing in Jerusalem. Not in uh, just some carnal excitement about religion, but a genuine relationship with Yeshua, the Messiah. That's what we're longing for. And as I heard that pastor, an Israeli pastor, ask kind of cynically, does the Bible talk about and in time awakening, I thought, yeah, it does. And I went home and wrote a book. <laughs> that is the truth. And, you know, I just began to open the Bible and search. You know, and one of the first things I came to was John chapter 10, uh, 2, rather. John chapter 2 is a very funny passage. Jesus, Yeshua, he comes back to the Galilee, to, uh, to Cana, where there is a wedding, Cana of Galilee. And, you know, you go to a wedding, you, you, you dress up, you, it says he took his disciples. It was a very exciting day. 
you know, you, you just very excited. They get to the wedding and, and, you know, people are happy and they're drinking. And, you know, I know it's Texas, but they were drinking. And, uh, and, then, and then Miriam, the mother of Jesus, she, she panics. You know, what, did somebody die? You know, did, you know, was there an accident? Did somebody's camel run over? Is it, what, what has happened, Miriam? They've run out of wine. You know, I've often wondered, Lord, why in the world would you make this the first miracle of Yeshua? I mean, he could have raised the dead. He could have cleansed a few lepers, right? There's so, he could have walked on water. There's so many other amazing things. Why wine? It's a kind of controversial. <laughs> could have chose something else. But you see, I believe there's a message here. That God was beginning the ministry of Yeshua with a prophetic message for us today. Let me go on. So Yeshua says to his mom, you know, there are things you can do when your son is actually, a lot of Jewish mothers think their son is the Messiah. She actually did have this Messiah as her son. And she took some liberty. And she said, they've run out of wine. And he says, he doesn't even say mom. He says, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time has not yet come. Ah, whatever. Whatever he says, do it. Urgh. You, know? <laughs> you can just picture him like this woman. You know? But he says to them, go get these six jars of uh, ceremonial jars, stone jars, put water in them, and then take some of that water and give it to the master of the ceremonies. So they do that, the servants. They bring out the wine, and they bring it to the master of the ceremonies. And he says this in verse 10. Everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now or till last. I think there's a message there. I think what God is saying is that he has saved the best until the end of the age. Yeshua is our bridegroom. It's all about him. It's his wedding. Hallelujah. And he has saved the best to last. Now, if we're going to use wine as a type or an example of a move of God, then we'd have to say that wine here is speaking about the first move of God, the book of Acts, everything you can see in the book. So the wine that they serve at the beginning of the wedding could be likened unto what we see in the book of Acts. Signs, wonders, miracle, the dead raised. Revival breaking out in Jerusalem, thousands of Jewish people being born again, and it's spreading all over the countryside. The disciples, now apostles, going out preaching in the. Have you ever read? I don't have. I wish I had about two hours with you or ten hours. But have you ever looked at Peter in the in Acts chapter two? Go home tonight and read his sermon. It's phenomenal. You understand? He was an unlearned fisherman. He had not gone to Bible school, much less seminary. He did not have the prophets memorized. And suddenly, when the Spirit of God hits him, he begins to quote Joel and begins to get divine revelation about the divinity of Jesus. He's telling Jesus just a few days before, you're not going to die and chopping people's ears off, right? I'll never deny you. I never knew the guy. Right? And now, here he is, a different man, under the power of the Holy Spirit. There's hope for me. Hallelujah. There's hope for you. God changed him, and suddenly he is like, like a world class theologian with anointing. What must we do to be saved? And that's just the beginning wine. <laughs> that's just the wine that was served at the beginning of the wedding. What is going to come our way is going to be even greater than the book of Acts, I believe. When's it going to happen? I got news for you, friends. It's already happening. Go to China, where there's 160 million believers. There's an apologist by the name of Jeremiah Johnston. He said, everything you read about in the book of Acts is happening in China right now. The Spirit of God is at work mightily. Everything you read about in the book of Acts, God is doing today. 
I'm good. One of my former students, Daniel Kalenda, became the, uh, 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 the heir apparent of uh, Christ for All Nations, Reinhard Bonnke. They go all over Africa. I've been with them there. I've seen the crowds of, uh, I was there, 700,000 people, miracles, it's so many miracles that you begin to get bored. Blind eyes opening. The lame walk, one screams all over the place as demons came out of people. They've seen over 50 million professions of faith. It's already happened. And you can line it right up with the restoration of Israel. There's a connection between the restoration of the Jewish people and the restoration of the church. I just spent time in Nepal. Did you know that Nepal has the fastest growing church in the world right now per capita. In, in uh, the early 2000s, they were less than 1% evangelical. Today, they're over 10%. That's 10% of your country getting born again. And when you were, had none, 2.5 million were going there in September to hold a pastor's conference. My friend and colleague, Asher Intrader, recently got back from Egypt where he reported that over 3 million Muslims have turned to Yeshua since the Arab Spring. This new wine, this end times wine is being poured out upon us. And if we go a little bit deeper into the book of John, we can see this pattern, kind of hidden patterns, prophetic patterns in the book of John. John chapter 4, Yeshua goes from Jerusalem to Galilee. He's there celebrating the feast and now it's time to go home. And on his way home, he stops in Samaria. How many of you know how many days he was in Samaria? Two days. He was in Samaria for two days, and then he goes back to the Galilee. They have a revival in Samaria during that time that he's there. You've read the story. Now, here's what I see prophetically. What does Peter say? Chapter, 2 Peter 3, 8. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Two days 2,000 years. Jesus starts in Jerusalem with the Jewish people, but then for two days or 2,000 years, he's with the Gentiles. By the way, Samaritans, many, some people, oh, they're Jew, no, they were not Jews. They were from, Samar uh, from Assyria. And when the northern ten tribes were taken into captivity in 721, they were, their populations were replaced. They came down from Assyria, and they became the uh, Samaritans. And so he spends symbolically 2,000 years with the Gentiles, and then he goes back to the Galilee, and it says that they welcomed him. Now, you know in the Galilee, they weren't always welcoming him. They were trying to kill him often, but it says they welcomed him. Now, I see two things there. Acts chapter one, verses six through eight, Jesus is with the disciples right before he disappears up into heaven. You know, these poor disciples, what they've been through. You know, they, you're never gonna die and everything's gonna be great. You're gonna take over the world and then he dies. And then they run away and then he shows up and he's back and he keeps showing up and oh, this is awesome, he's here. And then he's gone. <laughs> if Acts chapter two didn't happen, can you imagine the inner healing they would have needed? psychologists, <laughs> abandonment issues. <laughs> but they're with him before he disappears up into heaven. And they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I have heard so many preachers laugh at them. What a stupid question. Really? You're so smart and they're so dumb? They were asking the exact correct question that any student of the prophets would have asked. If you read the prophets, the goal of the prophets is the restoration of Israel and the Messiah coming and taking over the whole world. That is the longing in every Jewish heart. That's what Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is about, is the setting up of the kingdom of God on earth. That's what they're asking. Are you now going to fulfill what the prophet said? Notice he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't call them stupid. He doesn't tell them he's frustrated with them. He says, it's not for you to know the times that the Father set by his own authority. 
In other words, yeah, he's going to do it. Not now. Now I've got another job for you guys. In the meantime, before he restores the kingdom of Israel, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you are going to take this gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, the Adkitzot Haaretz, and to the ends of the earth. And they were, huh? What? <laughs> they didn't understand. But that's where he's, it's almost like he's saying, guys, listen, I've got, got, the Father has this great plan. And this great plan goes like this. He's going to, it's going to start here in Jerusalem, but it's going to go throughout the whole world. But in the end times, it's going to come right back here. And we're seeing that happen right now. It started in Jerusalem, and then for two days, 2,000 years, it went to the nations. And now, after, as we're ending the second millennium, we, it's coming back to the Jewish nation. And Jesus says, or rather it says in John chapter 4, they welcomed him. What does Jesus say to the Jews of Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27? He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's quiet, he's weeping, he's longing. Oh, I've, ga- I've longed to gather you together as a, as a hen gathers her chick, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. In other words, judgment's going to come. 2,000 years. Just a few years after that, Jerusalem is destroyed. The Jews are scattered. Do you understand? It is utterly impossible for a people to be scattered from their physical homeland for more than one or two generations before they're completely assimilated. There is no example of his, in history of a nation being separated from its geographical homeland for more than one or two, maybe three generations, except Israel. Forty generations. A little bit more than that. <laughs> 2,000 years. And he says, you're not going to see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. You're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But you see, that's not all that's in that verse. You see, when you go to Israel, some of you, I'm sure many of you have been to Israel, your plane landed, and there's a big sign. It says in Hebrew, Baruchim haba'im l'Israel. See, Baruch Haba, it means welcome. If you come over to my house uh, tonight, Friday night, Shabbat dinner, and I open, the first thing I'm saying is Baruch Haba. I am welcoming. Jesus is saying to the Jews of Jerusalem, I am not coming back until you welcome me. That's exactly what we see in John chapter 4. He's in Jerusalem two days or 2,000 years with the Gentiles, and then the Jews welcome him back. It's happening today. And, and, ah, (laughs) <laughs> and we see more proof, biblical, solid, theological proof in Romans 11. You know, Paul wrote Romans 11 because uh, uh, there was an anti-Jewish sentiment that began to arise in the Roman church. You see, the Jews were kicked out of Rome from 49 to 54. But when they came back, they were treated by the church like second-class believers, even if believers at all. We know about this from history. I don't have time to go into it. But when they come back, they're not welcomed. And and somehow, probably from Priscilla and Aquila, word got to Paul. Paul was an apostle. And as an apostle, he understood apostolic borders, that you don't build on somebody else's foundation. Paul had never been to Rome. Every letter he wrote was to people that he had a relationship with where he was the spiritual father of their congregation of Corinth, Ephesus, but not Rome. He broke his rule because something was happening at Rome that was so disturbing. And it was the first, the beginnings of the church turning against the Jewish people. And he, you read Romans 11. Imagine Paul pleading. He's already said in Romans 9, don't, in Romans 9, don't you understand, Romans? I would go to hell for the sake of my brothers, the Israelites, that they may be saved. Romans 10.1, my heart's desire is for the Israelites that they would be saved. And then in Romans 11, he lays it out theologically. They were broken off because of unbelief, but you're grafted in by faith. Don't be arrogant, but be afraid because God can break you off too. It's a very scary passage. 
But Paul is writing it. He's pleading with the Roman church, which interestingly enough became the Roman Catholic Church, the headquarters of institutional Christianity, political Christianity, and turned against the Jewish people. But in the midst of Romans 11, when he's warning them, he shares a secret with them. He says, guys, you got to understand this. He said, verse 11, or verse uh, 12. He says, if Israel's transgression, what was their transgression? Rejection of the gospel. If Israel's transgression means riches for the world, and Israel's loss, riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full, full inclusion bring? I don't know if you got that. Let me explain that to you. If Israel did the wrong thing in rejecting the gospel, and somehow by doing the wrong thing, they caused a world revival. Through the rejection of the gospel, the apostles were scattered, and it caused revival in the nations. Paul's saying, imagine what happens when this chosen people line up with God's order. What kind of blessing is that going to bring on the earth? He uses the terms riches and greater riches. He says if their sin, if their rejection caused riches, he says how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? So we gotta ask ourselves, if, if, if we're gonna find out you know, what greater, somebody promises me, Ron, I'm gonna give you greater riches. Well, first I gotta figure out what riches are. Because maybe it's like a couple baseball cards and greater riches are a couple more baseball cards, you know? Not that exciting. Or maybe it's diamonds and rubies and all kinds of gems. So Paul is saying their rejection called, caused something that he refers to as riches. Riches would be the wine at the beginning of the wedding or the book of Acts. Riches are what had happened through Paul's ministry up to the writing of Romans. It had already happened. He's writing about what had happened. Their rejection caused, past tense, riches. This great revival that we're seeing all over the, the Asia and Europe, that's riches. And he says when the Jewish people accept the gospel, it's going to cause greater riches, something exponentially more powerful than what we had seen up until that point. Do you get it? It's going to be awesome. And we're in the beginning of that right now all over the world. Because two things are happening. Jewish people are beginning to accept the good news of Yeshua. I am proof of that. Many of you in this room are proof of that. And that is causing the beginning of this greater riches revival. And then we see in chapter, in verse 15... He says, for if Israel's rejection brought the reconciliation to the world, what will Israel's acceptance be but life from the dead? Israel's rejection caused the Gentiles to be reconciled to God. They did the wrong thing. And it, 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 you know, it's like an investor, you know, or a would-be investor. And you give him $5,000, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's throwing it here, throwing it there. He has no clue what he's doing, and he comes back with $50,000. How did you do it? I don't know. I, 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 I buried it, and I came out with $50,000. It's unbelievable. You'd say to that person, man, if you, through doing the wrong thing, caused my, my, my $5,000 to become $50,000, what's going to happen when you actually put yourself towards investing? You'll be the best investor in the world. Through Israel's rejection, the Gentiles were reconciled to God. But when they do the right thing and they accept, it's going to cause life from the dead. We are right now in the beginning of celebrating Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. That's what it's talking about. The Jewish acceptance of Yeshua is going to cause the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. It's going to cause the resurrection of the dead, which is going to happen when Yeshua returns. You see, all over the world, there are going to be Jewish people this weekend celebrating the Feast of Trumpets, and they have no idea why. They have no idea what it's about. 
You read Leviticus chapter 23. Don't work, blow trumpets, have a good day. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much a holiday. Well, what, what are we commemorating? Don't worry about it. It'll make sense one day. There, there, there's no clue. There's no hint. Walk around blowing trumpet. Why? Don't know. It can only be understood in light of the new covenant. Where Bible, the Bible speaks about that great trumpet where we're changed in a twinkling of an eye. The resurrection of the dead. Now I want to speak to you tonight. Because maybe you came here tonight and you're thinking, I don't know how I ended up in this church. <laughs> Your friend brought you. Listen, believe me, I know. I, I remember. But you're here. Or maybe you're watching by internet. You're not here by accident. And you're not watching by accident. See, the Bible's very clear. We're getting ready to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, but go back to Pesach, to Passover. The story's about a lamb, a beautiful, perfect, one-year-old lamb. It had, couldn't have any spot, but couldn't have any defects, had to be perfect, and then that lamb would be sacrificed, and the blood of that lamb would be taken and put on the doorpost of the house, right? And then the angel that would come, the angel of death, would not be able to touch any home with the blood on the doorpost. You see, Abraham, he took his son Isaac up to be sacrificed. Very similar. They were going to make a sacrifice for the Lord. And I don't know what was up with Isaac. Maybe he was a little bit slow. I don't know. Some say he was like in his 30s or 40s. And he's like, Dad, uh, we got wood. <laughs> We've got fire. See that knife? Um, where's the sacrifice? Don't worry, son. God is going to provide. Okay. <laughs> they go up the mountain. Next thing you know, he's tying up his son, breaking his heart. He's going to kill his son. Sacrifice. And the Lord says, stop. And there's a ram caught in the thickets. Not a lamb, not a one-year-old lamb, but an adult male, ram. Abraham prophesied that God would provide a lamb. And you see, Abraham and God, they were buddies. They were friends. And Abraham just said, hey, God, I'm willing to give you my most prized possession, my only son. How could God do any less? Took him a little while. But about 2,000 years later, John, you ever heard of a guy named John the Baptist? I got news for you. Is this on tape? He wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> he was a Jewish prophet. And he looked at his cousin, Yeshua, Jesus, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus lived 33 years of perfection. He was born not of me, not of a human. God himself put a pure seed inside of a little Jewish girl named Miriam. And when he came out of the womb, he was perfect. And like that Passover lamb, he poured out his blood for you. Now, I have your blood. What is he talking about? <laughs> Believe me, I've asked those same questions. But it's true. It's biblical. The Bible says there's no forgiveness of sin. Do you want to be forgiven of your sin? The Bible says there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Someone must die for you. I'll die for my own sins. Really? Is that what you want to do? Do you really want to stand before a holy God who has made a way for you to have salvation and say, I'll die for my own sins? Not me. I'll take the free gift. But that's what Yeshua did. He willingly, like a lamb, even though he had all the power of God at his disposal, he let people kill him so that you could be saved. And all you have to do is give him your whole life. He gave you his whole life. 
He didn't hold anything back. And now he's asking for you to return the favor and give your life to him. It's awesome. Listen, <laughs> I, I know the confusion. I'm Jewish. When I was in 1983, at 18 years old, I became convinced that he was the Messiah. And it was an earthquake in the Jewish community in Richmond, Virginia. But it was worth it. I found the pearl of great price. And I wasn't going to let it go. I want to just invite you today that you can be born again. You can have God come and live inside of you. You can be regenerated, renewed. You can be set free of addictions. You can be healed of diseases through the power of God. But you must confess that Yeshua is the Messiah and turn from your sins. So I want to invite you right now. Maybe the prayer team could come up right now. I want to invite you right now that if you have never confessed Yeshua is Lord, tonight's the night, brand new. And whatever your need may be, maybe there's healing. I want to pray just briefly for healing. Some of you are here tonight and you need healing in your body. Let's just pray and then you can come up and get more prayer. But if you're here tonight and you've never confessed Jesus, it's now's the day. Right now your heart's kind of beating. That's the Holy Spirit tugging on you saying, yeah, this is it. This is real. It's radical. And it's going to change you forever. There are people I hated the day before I gave my life to the Lord. I wouldn't have cared if they died. And the next day I loved them. I cared for them. Something changed on the inside of me. The Bible says that the old man dies and you become a new person. So I want you to, if that's you tonight, I want you to make your way to one of these people here to pray with you, to agree with you. And if you need healing in your body, just stand up where you are right now. I'm going to pray a brief prayer. Father, in the name of Yeshua, right now we just release healing in this building. We speak to cancer and we command it to disappear brain tumors to go away, a back pain to go away, chronic a joint pain to go away. Right now, we ask that the Spirit of God would fall in this place right now and that everyone here would experience healing, that the presence of God would come on them right now. Father, wherever the gospel is preached, there is power to heal the sick. So tonight, the gospel has been preached and we expect the sick to be healed. In Yeshua's name. Amen.